it to you if you have questions or want to discuss. And then after ours will be Eduardo's fantastic presentation, which we're deeply looking forward to. So thank you, Victoria. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, I feel like my IQ has already gone up a couple notches sitting at the <laughs> table with these folks, and I can't wait to tell my mom because I was a C minus student my whole life. Um, but I was a little intimidated coming out here to speak to you about this, um, but after just my brief conversation with Eduardo, it makes perfect sense for parks to be represented here um, because that's the core of a community, it's the heartbeat of a community. Um, and it indicates not just the physical health of the whole community, um, but the financial and the economic and the emotional health uh, of the community. I wanted to share with you a very famous quote from George Bernard Shaw that says, we don't stop playing because we get old, we grow old because we stop playing. And that's what parks is about. And that's what I'm here to talk about, the play and the fun of parks, regardless of age, address, or ability. So one of the things we're really excited about, and I'm sure you've heard statistics um, all morning, and you'll certainly hear it from my uh, panelists uh, after my presentation, is that the active older adult community is growing by leaps and bounds. And even within that community of 55 and older, you have very able-bodied folks. I'm a former triathlete, and I'll tell you those ladies in the over 50 group were amazing out there. There was the high, that was the most competitive age group, 45 to 55, um, out in the triathlon world. Um, and then, so within that 55 age group, you have some really active, engaged, enthusiastic, uh, able-bodied folks, and then you have the ones that are a little bit more limited. And so Parks had to come in and figure out what are we gonna do to bring them all together? Because obviously we've heard that socialization is very important, getting them out of their houses, um, and into some type of a situation where they're, commun they're communing, communing with others and they're getting physically fit was important. So we went out to our communities um, and surveyed our active older adults to come up, to let them decide how they want to play and how they want to have fun. Um, and we just gave them that. Um, in our Continental Park uh, program, which is out on 104th Street, uh, it's very Hispanic. Uh, so we have to have a Hispanic uh, leader who's doing Zumba. They love to dance. They love the music. Uh, whether they're sitting in the chair doing it or they're learning the routine, they are in, alive when that sound comes up. For our African American community in the inner city, they didn't have that same connection to that type of physical activity. Uh, so what we do with them is more of the hardcore workout. We are looking, they are using the equipment at the, at the gym. They are doing chair exercising using weights or resistance band. Yoga has become very popular in this demographic. And so we are doing our best to feed them the food that they want so that they keep coming back. One of the things we learned about them is that they are consistent. So the minute that we throw in something, whether it's a different instructor or a different program, it, it doesn't work. You can't have two competing things at the same time, even if they're in parks, you know, in two different sites. They don't want that. They are loyal and they are um, creatures of habit, which is a great thing. Uh, but we found that we've had to make a couple of, we've made a couple of mistakes in trying to program things at a time when they're used to going to whatever programs they have been going to, and certainly not changing their instructor. <laughs> One of the things that we probably did in the last five years, and really have kicked it up a notch these last two years, is to create what we call a fitness zone. One of the things that we found is that Parks is no longer just this place. It's not just this ball field, it's not just this swimming pool. It is a feeling. And for active older adults who may be helping out their children and their grandchildren by taking Johnny to baseball, we need to come up with a way to engage them. That sitting and watching their, their grandchild play baseball wasn't enough for them. And so we needed to really think about that intergenerational component to building our parks. And so 
we've developed these fitness zones and we've been really fortunate to have partners like TD Bank, TPL, work with us in creating these. And so what happens is they're close to a playground or to a ball field where the grandparent or parent can drop off their kid in comfort and then go out and get on these um, the equipment. The instructions are in the three languages. They are low intensity. There's a workout that you can go through. It's beautifully done. There's shade trees. Um, they, this helps them with their balance. It's a wonderful way for them to try it out before they go into the gym. These are free. They're open um, sunrise to sunset. And um, it gives them a purpose now, other than just going and being the spectator, but, but they are a participator. It also, without them knowing probably, they are now that new role model for their grandchild and their children, that they are physically fit. Um, what I, I was recalling as I was coming over here, when I was training for one of my races, I, I, used to, I was a single mom at the time, and my daughter was on her scooter. And I was running, and I fell over a, a, a root that had come up. And I'm bleeding, and my daughter's crying. <laughs> she's like, like, she said, we have to go home. We have to go home. You're hurt. I'm like, no, I have to run 10 miles. It's like in my thing. And, and just that moment, that example of saying, I'm not going to quit, and I'm going to show you what inner strength is like, has translated into her life today. And that's what, on a very small scale, these fitness zones do. When you see your elderly parent, and I, would, I had a picture of my mom um, with, our, with one of our ribbon cuttings, and I should have brought it so you can see the big smile on her face. Uh, she served as our senior model and felt super confident on, these, um, on the equipment, and it just made her feel so great. The beautiful thing, too, about this is you're outside. I'm a gym rat, I just work out in the air condition with the music blaring. Um, I have a place in North Carolina, when I go for a hike, I am a different person, even though it's not high intensity, just from being outside. So these are really powerful tools. Um, these are the areas that they're in. We try to, to take them all the way from the north end to the south end. You can imagine we're unincorporated Miami-Dade Park System. So we take you down all the way south to the Boone's Prime area, up through the west and into the North Dade section. So it's quite a big territory, um, but they've become hugely popular. So as um, Joanna was mentioning, our partnership and collaboration between UM and Miami Dade Parks was this um, technological, which doesn't really translate to healthy uh, lifestyle sitting in front of your computer, but I, trust me, this is healthy. Um, it is called parks305.org, and this was our opportunity to make the county system with all of its municipal partners, its national uh, park sites, be boundaryless. This is where everything is stored parks related in the county. So it's kind of like the Yelp now. So you want to find a restaurant in this area, it just takes, it gives you your location, it gives you everything you want in order of ranking, of price point or um, uh, rating. This is the same thing. This is having, this is letting people know what's available to them at the area that they're in. And we don't care if it's a city of a Coral Gables Park or a town of Miami Lakes Park. We want you to just be in a park. What's beautiful about this site is that it gives you the nuggets of health and research, depending on how far down you want to dig. So when you're searching for something, you, you, can, either, you can do it by activity. You will get a list of what's in the area, and then you will get a little nugget of advice. Living near a park or green, green space may help you live longer. That's for the person on the go who doesn't want it, doesn't need any more information, and they're good. They have a new, maybe perhaps, purpose for their workout because they know now not only are they going to feel good, maybe have some health benefits, but that being in the park is going to have this additional benefit. There are even further, um, there's even further information on this in the form of journal journals and research for the person who wants to really understand it. So we're marrying a county service with research and putting this together in a really easy, simple way for the average person to understand. 
Um, and I think that that's also another thing that separates Miami-Dade Parks. Our program, we have a few programs that are data-based, evidence-based. We were looking at the quality of a child when they start the programs, their quality of workout, uh, their uh, biometrics, and we're taking them through the whole year and then doing a, and then capturing what they look like at the end. And when I say look like, it's not the physical, it's what their, their numbers look like. And, and that's a really powerful tool for a parent. It, now that time after school isn't just about, well, they're safe somewhere, although it's very important, obviously, but that there's a real purpose behind the activity that they're doing with us. And this is why it matters. We want to make sure that everybody has at least access to the information in an easy to read format. And that's where Parks 305 um, comes in. The experts provided it with us. We have one level for very easy to, under, for easy to understand. And then we have the deeper research um, for those who really want to get um, more information and really to understand why it all matters. Why are we doing this? Um, you know, I, I know that habits are, you know, it, to do something over and over again is a really important thing, but sometimes you lose sight of what it is and you lose that motivation. Um, we're hoping that through this, there'll be constant reminders and constant ways for people to, to just dig a little deeper, go a little bit more, challenge themselves, um, and we're really excited about it because it does bring us together with all of our partner um, systems. And then just a couple of little things that we're looking at. We have a new director who came on board in August and it's, it's fascinating because she is a landscape architect by trade. And so her perspective to parks is so different than an ops guy. You know, who's, who's worried about, you know, the baseball bat. And I'm not saying she's not worried about that, but she's looking at this as, the, as a bigger picture for the community and how we look at our community. And, um, and just these are some of the things that we're, we're doing as far as um, developing our age-friendly parks, park zones, fitness zones, how it's going to look. Um, one of the big things is the trees. Uh, and growing, making sure that they're there, the non-slip pavement, which is obvious, um, and that we have good signage. And as I mentioned, we've got those three signs in three different languages for our, um, our users. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Brown. Well, thank you, Victoria. And I also want to say, first of all, um, I'm delighted to be here today, and I want to give a sh shout out to uh, some of my uh, both current and, and former students who I see in the audience, as well as some of our community partners that we have worked with these last few years, uh, not only trying to do research on uh, best practices for parks and green and health, but also uh, to translate that um, information into the community where it really matters. Uh, so uh, my background is, uh, I'm in public health sciences at the University of Miami. I've been working with uh, Joanna Lombard here at, at least a decade, and more recently, the last few years, have been working uh, with uh, Miami-Dade Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces and what's been great about this collaboration is that we have a parks director who is really interested in evidence-based practices and policies, and as Joanna will probably mention in a few minutes, that uh, Maria Nardi is the uh, ar architect or creator of a 50-year master plan for uh, trying to create more equitable uh, access to uh, parks and green spaces with the notion that um, it's not simply parks access that, that's important, although that's a critical aspect to it, but it's also the ability to access green and open spaces within even a five or, or 10 minute walk from your door. So uh, the slide that, that's shown here illustrates uh, what most of us already know coming to a Fit City conference, that uh, physical activity, healthy food, and positive social interactions have all been shown through decades of research to be important for uh, health and well-being. And in, in the work that we've been doing uh, with parks and also the Florida Department of Health and Miami-Dade County, uh, we have been uh, successful in trying to distill what's really important 
in accessible language, working with, with Victoria, who's been great uh, in, in trying to identify different levels uh, at which people can access the information. Uh, so the prior slide uh, gave the information, you may live longer if you uh, spend more time in, in green spaces and parks. Uh, so for the interested reader, we actually um, have a, a drill down for people to uh, get accessible, pu publicly available information on the research, including the latest research on uh, parks and green spaces and how that may benefit them personally. Um, so, uh, as mentioned before, there, there have been a number of studies suggesting that if you live or work near uh, walkable green spaces, that that may uh, help you live longer. Uh, so this is a, a particular example of a study that is on the Parks 305 website. If you click on Get the Facts, uh, you can pull up this study by Takano and colleagues uh, that is looking at uh, five-year survival of over 3,000 uh, seniors in Tokyo, Japan, and basically showing that after controlling for um, other individual and uh, area-level um, variables such as uh, income and marital status, um, the factor of, of having walkable uh, green streets and spaces seems to be a critical factor that is associated with, with living longer. Uh, so again, this is taking uh, research that in the old days we used to say that we didn't want our research to simply uh, be journals on dusty shelves that nobody used. Well, this is an opportunity where people on their computer or their mobile phone, if they're interested, can dig down further into the research results. And uh, we also provide uh, short summaries uh, so again, different levels of information and access. Um, also, uh, we find that uh, access to uh, natural environments, parks and green spaces can make you happier. Uh, there was a study that we provide again on the Parks 305 website. Uh, Matthew White and colleagues from, uh, I believe, the University of Exeter in uh, the United Kingdom uh, conducted research uh, looking at 10,000 adults uh, living in the United Kingdom, and this is based on research uh, following people for 18 years. So this is a very um, substantive research study. Uh, and so th their finding is basically that, that individuals uh, report greater life satisfaction and are happier if they lived in areas with more green space. So again, if you want to live longer, if you want to be happier. These are reasons for, uh, for either using the parks or, or green spaces that are in your, your neighborhood, which you can find out about on Parks 305, or also advocating for having more walkable green spaces uh, close to where you live. Um, we also showed in our own research, which uh, is um, yet to be added to Parks 305, but we will do so shortly, that we, we found uh, that uh, living on uh, blocks with higher levels of green or uh, vegetative presence, such as tree canopy, may reduce your risk of chronic conditions. And this was based on um, a study uh, funded in part by the Health Foundation of South Florida and also the US Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, that um, actually used uh, data from 250,000 Medicare beneficiaries residing here in Miami-Dade County, which is the entire uh, universe of older adults who receive Medicare, who live in the county. And we found that uh, older adults who, who received Medicare and lived on a block with higher levels of greenness uh, had approximately 49 fewer chronic conditions per 1,000 individuals, and this is basically uh, roughly equivalent to a reduction in biomedical aging by three years. So what does this mean? It means that if you live in a block with higher levels of, of greenery, such as tree cover or parks, 
that you may look like somebody who is three years younger in terms of the total number of chronic conditions that you have. And uh, most interestingly, we also showed that um, these effects are particularly strong in um, residents of low income neighborhoods, approximately 50% stronger. So we, we took into account uh, the role of um, socioeconomic status and um, this finding illustrates uh, that it's all the more important to have that access to, to green and parks for all members of the population. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Joanna, who's going to talk about applications of the research. Thank you, Scott. So, we just picked a few things to show you, like three slides. Um, the first one is really important. Scott talked about Maria Nardi's leadership, but I would say, to back up a minute, many people in this room participated in the development of this plan because there were 350 sessions in the community from um, all over the county, all different kinds of people. The 34 municipalities participated in it, signed on to it. I, I think, Caesar, you must have come to events or even manage them for this process. And the process was a, literally from the ground up. Why? Because when you're building a community and you want to understand what people want, it's really not a good idea to listen to experts. Right? And I, I'm, I'm not an expert. <laughs> But I wouldn't listen to, you know, we all have opinions, but the truth is we're much smarter when we're all together, and we all have great ideas, and we have to be respectful and listen to each other. Then experience and wisdom comes into play, and that's where your experience, Dr. Thur and I were talking about this in relation to medicine. I told him I felt like, the, you know, all of the um, decision-making had been offloaded to me as a patient, and I'm saying, yeah, that's kind of how it's working these days. But the reality is, we need to know, we need to be informed, but then we need to work with people who have wisdom and experience, and then we have to use our best judgment. This park system is the basis of that kind of good judgment. And what you see there are the goals. And notice the top goal. Every residence, every resident in the county should be within five minutes of a park. And then this map, which is hard to see, but you can go online and pull the plan up. Every single one of those is a new park that we need so that everybody is within five minutes of a park. And this plan is noted for the idea that parks start at your door. Cheryl had the exhibit at the MCAT, which was parks at our door. So the minute we step outside and we have a sidewalk and a street tree, we're in the park. So if you stop and you think about cities that you know, the image of the city is often tied up with its sense of the park. Well, now we understand why this is so important. And we have Evidence after evidence, and, and that's what Victoria was telling me was on the site. So I thought it could be interesting to go from this plan, which came from all of us, has been research validated in just about every capacity, to what's really going on. So this is a program that's going on in the county. Gabby Lopez, I think, is leading this up. The Million Trees Miami, do you all know about this? Some people say yes now. So this happened to be how many trees, when I grab the screenshot, if you go on it, there's probably going to be a different number, I hope. But the point of this is to take the research, which Scott just presented to you. So if you could go into a low-income neighborhood and plant trees, do we solve all the problems of that neighborhood? No. But we know that we make it more likely that people who are elderly will feel safe, that they will walk more, that they will have greater levels of physical activity. When you're out walking, you naturally have social interaction. And these are the things that have been pulled away from us when we live in age-segregated communities or communities we can only reach by cars. And we came to this, and this is why this is important, is because Scott and I did our first study at Liesl Havana, and we were looking at children, and we were looking at children's conduct grades because that predicts children's future in many ways that are not surprising. And one of the things we noticed during that study, aside from the fact that children did better on mixed-use blocks, we noticed that there were a lot of elders sitting in front on porches, on stoops, on terraces, and we wondered, these, and then I would drive home to Coconut Grove where I would see elders being wheeled around in wheelchairs at Grove Isle. That's a big difference, right? 
So we said, let's take a look at these. We found elders on every block, and we found the following people, 75 and older, for five years, the people who lived on blocks with socially supportive features, porches, balconies, and stoops, lived longer and were healthier. So if we could add trees to that scenario, we think we could make a very big difference. So we have an opportunity here. You can contact the Million Trees, you can contribute to it, you can say, hey, this street needs it, or you can tell us, hey, this street got it over the last few years, and we'd like you to study it. Because our next study that we're working into is we're trying to look at neighborhoods from the, the last study we had on the Medicare data from 2010. We know in Florida, when you plant a tree in 2010, it looks pretty good by 2017, even in spite of the so-called Hurricane Irma. Um, it was Irma, and it was bad, but we have to face facts. This is another conversation. It wasn't a hurricane for us. So when we look at the trees, the canopy around the city, we can start to look at where did things improve? And once we understand where things improved from a green point of view, we can look at the health statistics, and we can see if there was an impact. And then the last thing I want to show you is this is a project in Philadelphia. It's very cool. It's with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. And they teamed up with HUD, um, Husband and Urban Development, gave them the money. And they had, this is based on some interesting studies that, there was a study quite a long time ago at Ida B. Wells Housing Project in Chicago. And socio-demographically, the, the units were basically the same. But what was different is some courtyards had trees and some courtyards did not. And they consistently found that with the courtyards with the trees, there were lower levels of crime, higher levels of feeling of social connectedness. So just the presence of a tree. So Francis Quo went on to make a career, I think at University of Illinois, Illinois Chicago. So you can read a lot of the studies that she has done with her team. And over and over and over again, we see that trees make a difference. So in Philadelphia, they said, you know, we have this situation. What if we plant a tree and green a vacant lot? <coughs> what happens? And so Drexel University and Penn got together, and they started to study the impacts. And they found over time there were lower, le lower levels of crime, lower levels of gun violence, and there were higher levels of social connectedness and feelings of neighborhood safety. So this is a great project. And so then they started to go from here to community gardens and then hiring people. There's a great, this, if you look this up online, you'll see that there's a project that hires people who are recently released from prison to do maintenance on these landscapes. And then those people can go on to horticulture jobs in the horticulture industry. So this is a really interesting thing for us to consider here in Miami-Dade County because we know we have drainage issues and we know we need more green space. And I'm showing you here um, one of our codes and ordinances that we could maybe gather together to change to make something like that happen. This is the community garden. Right now, if you wanted to put a community garden and you found a great place, we'd run into a permitting problem, right? Because Community gardens are only allowed in those 12 areas. Those are the urban center districts. Oh. Hmm, exactly. So one of the things that we thought would be interesting today is to show you this kind of panorama of parks mm -hmm. and to lead you a bit through some of the leading research and then to leave you with an action plan, which is because we know we have an enormous number of studies, not ours personally, but many people have done studies on the role of community gardens with older adults and with children. Since today's age friendly, we're going to talk a little bit briefly about both. Not only, you don't even have to actually work in the garden. You just have to be part of the community garden group, and your health outcomes look better, your sense of positive attitude toward life, lower level of depression, higher level of social connectedness. And I keep coming back to social connectedness because that is really the essence of life. And if you ask yourself, why are we all doing this? Like, really, why are we here? We're here because we are in this journey of life together. And our connectedness to each other is what helps us endure the difficult times and enjoy the happy times. And if the physical place that we live works against that connectedness, we are depriving of ourselves of really the most profound and important aspects of life. And so this is an opportunity for us to reweave this together. And when we hear about these numbers of people that are aging, well, most, if you look at the statistics that are on the ARP website, 68, and actually the statistics, the age-friendly statistics for Miami-Dade County that you shared with us, 68% of the people want to stay where they are. 
I think we have a great opportunity to help everybody do that. So thank you very much. Do you, we don't, do you have any questions? We have a roving mic. Yes, all the way at the back table. I couldn't agree more that community gardens are needed. There's actually one on my block. Uh, I live in Coconut Grove, and so I'm a tree hugger and a tree lover. Uh, but, you know, I, I really think that there should be more options. I mean, when you see broken down buildings and abandoned buildings and, and a lot of empty lots, and there, there are empty lots in my neighborhood too, uh -huh. uh, one of them became a community garden. I really think that the city and the county needs to look into why not make it a community garden. It might not have to stay that way forever, uh -huh. but that is a great opportunity to bring communities together. And, and the other great part about community gardens is that it, they actually produce food. So it's true. Uh, yes. we, we had a very big program in Broward County with mentors in schools, and several of them started community gardens at the schools with their kids. And the, and the food was divided up. I mean, it was producing food and given to families that needed it. Uh, so, I mean, I just think, you know, this is a great opportunity, and I, I don't think we should miss this opportunity. Thank you so much for pointing that out and for pointing out the food. And Margaret is here, I think, from Baptist. Is she? She was here. Anyway, um, Baptist was the reason, there's a group in Richmond, Tricycle Gardens, that started with neighborhood community gardens, kind of like the greening of vacant lots. They then began, became volunteers to install community gardens in hospitals, and then the hospitals used the fresh produce in their kitchens. And Baptist Kendall, West Kendall, has uh, started a community garden, I believe. So I think you're right, and also um, the other thing that they did in Richmond is interesting, is the healthcare system there created what they call like a mobile um, kitchen. And the kitchen would go around the different parts of the neighborhood to teach people how to use, what can you do with this produce. Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island created a kind of corner store program where they took all the sort of corner markets that sell food that is a lot of packaged food and they made them two promises. One promise was we will, because when you have fresh food and, it, and a fresh, an apple and it goes bad, the store owner has to throw it away. When someone doesn't buy the cheese whiz, you get to send it back to the manufacturer and it sits there for another 10 years. So one of the things that, so one of the things they did is they said, we will buy back any fresh produce that you don't sell, and we will send a celebrity chef, and we have a lot of these in Miami, to your store on different weekends, rotating, to teach people what to do with this produce. And those have been great successful programs. So there's a lot of opportunity to make a difference. Anybody else? Do you have a microphone? Oh, you do. Yeah, so um, my first question was um, for the barbs, if you about barbs. I was wondering if the schools were included in that, because a lot of the schools have tracks and local trails. So I just was wondering if that was part of the app to kind of let you know where to go in that sense, and if that's allowed. Oh, um, so no, the, part, the schools, we, there are certain schools that we um, enjoy a joint use agreement with, um, and that's where we're either managing the facility and they use it, or it's their facility and we um, use it for our programs, but they're not represented here in this system, in this, um, in this website, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then my second question was, uh, we talk a lot about um, food and trees and shade trees, um, but one important thing is actual food trees and um, having food trees in parks and actually food trees in places that are conducive to people that are playing and being active and they can have a healthy snack while you're doing it. And so the only it. place you, we have fruit trees is at the Fruit and Spice Park. Um, and it's a wonderful, beautiful jewel in South Dade. <coughs> Um, the only one of its kind, it's a botanical garden of fruits and spices. And what's so beautiful about that um, property is that we have people uh, from all over the world who live here. And when they go to that park and they taste uh, a fruit from their country, they're transported back to their childhood or to their grandmother's kitchen. But because of the care that fruit trees take and, and, and things like that, we keep our fruit trees there 
but we have workshops, propagation workshops, seedling workshops. Um, this, it's a wonderful, very inexpensive afternoon. It's eight dollars to get in um, for you to explore that. And Is it? Oh, I'm not sure. I think that for the Million Tree Movement, you know, if your street got to, if what, if we got our street together and said we really want to populate our street with trees, we're going to take care of them, then they'll come and plant them. You could select fruit trees yes, because you are totally onto something and you're in the right place. Because George Merrick's idea was that we would not have traditional farms. We, well, he, as you know, he had the grapefruit fields. His view was that we should have arbor culture, and he got John Gifford, who was a botany professor at UM. He's, noted for bringing the Malaluka, so that's pretty bad rap. <laughs> but aside from the bad rap, he really had a lot of good things to do, and one of the things was they were trying to suggest that our soil, because of the limestone soil, we should not really try to do traditional agriculture, we should actually do arbor culture, and we should be growing all of these different trees, and a number of people took him up on that. And you would write me for the first vice president. Yeah, it's a, but uh, she's just in, yeah. I was talking about like just community activation, and that's really a lot of how um, my director wants to see the future too. All of this master plan was created um, in large part because of the community with the um, oversight of the experts. But we have communities. Uh, we have the, the um, military trail park, and this it was it was an underused, grown, overgrown lot that is now a gem in this community. They they just, they lost trees in Hurricane Irma, they raised $1,500 in two weeks, and they had a Christmas party for this tree that they planted. You know, who buys a tree that's 50, like, we buy little ones, theirs was already big. Um, and it's that activation, that community activation, that neighborhood activation that can really start the conversation um, and change the landscape, figuratively and literally, um, for that. The other thing too, for this particular community garden, we took a lot of grants. Um, and we're trying to find those areas and those grant dollars um, to do things like this. Um, this was part of Martin Luther King Day celebration up at Gwen Cherry Park. It was a multi-generational um, volunteer project. And um, right now, as we're in the growing season, they will do programming for the kids in our Fit to Lead program, who will then cultivate and harvest. Um, we also have, each year, the NRPA has a contest for the Walt Disney, um, yep, the National Recreation Park Association has this project campaign, and um, my job as the, the communications person is to make sure that the information gets out to you so you can vote on a particular project, and the community picks the project. We come up with three projects, we give you a description, we give you a cost, and we let people vote. And it's a social media kind of campaign to get people interested in parks. Vote, you know? <laughs> That's all I can say is vote. We did a community garden um, similar to this up at Ogis uh, a year ago. Um, we did a disability um, fence for a disability services group. And it's another way for you all to have a voice, the, the average folks to have a voice in what happens to our, our parks. I just have one, sorry, I just have one last comment for Joanne. Uh, in yeah. regards to the fruit trees oh. along the streets, yeah. uh, my biggest concern- It's um, dropping on the cars? No, it's actually the exhaust. <laughs> I've heard cars. that. <laughs> it's actually the exhaust from the cars and, and what effect that has on the fruit. So you, you want to make sure yeah. it's actual healthy fruit. It is so true. it's a high volume, high traffic street. Yeah. It's probably not the best place, but it's a low value, low speed. Residential yeah, like a residential area. street. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. And we had one more question here, Mr. Bill. Yes. Um, I think, is Pete Wood still here? Yes. So Pete actually heads up a committee that's on the health impacts of the underlying and the um, commissioned a health impact assessment. And one of the really interesting things that came out of that health impact assessment is that the underlying could be most powerful if it's interconnected into the neighborhoods. And so for us to think of the underlying, right now the underlying is a project that goes from South Dade to Brickell, and that's what most people think of. But what we think of from a health perspective is the underlying goes from South Dade to the, through the MLK station all the way up and turns up on Northwest 79th, I guess it is. That's the underlying. And everywhere it intersects with those neighborhoods, those fingers where people can reach it and get to it and see it and connect it, 
That's the beginning of the Blueway and Greenway, which is the interconnected county that's part of our plan. Thank you. So I'm wondering, uh, when it comes to design and the building space, everyone has a fine line between their client's budget and creating a beautiful space. Yes. Are there any incentives or programs that we could talk about that might help bridge that gap and make it easier to talk to a client about taking on that additional expense? You know, that's a really cool idea. And we have incentives for areas that we want to encourage economic development. What if we created incentives for areas where we want to enhance green development, right? So Caesar, you're here, and I know you've been doing workshops with the city of Miami. But this could be, and we, and Victoria can take it back. There are other people here from the county. It's um, it's definitely something to think about, and we could also tie it into our resilience efforts because these green spaces aren't just good for us. You know, they're really good for the planet, and they're going to make it possible for us to live here longer than if we didn't do them. So that's a great idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Um, this is for the Parks Department, and I have to commend the parks. I love it. I use the parks all the time. I just discovered the uh, fitness equipment at A.D. Barnes Park. Oh, great. My kids went there to the nature camp, oh, um, and I do yoga at Continental Park. But I have, but I, but here's now here's my statement though. Um, this past Monday was was Columbus Day, so the park was Middle Park was closed. We or at least the Dice House was. And my understanding is that because I think, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but senior staff had the day off. But sometimes there's junior staff at some of the parks, but there wasn't enough funding, or there's not enough there's not enough staff. They're understaffed. I don't, I don't mean to be political, but yes I am, because I remember that there was a, a referendum or something for a, maybe a half a penny tax or something years ago that was supposed to go to improving parks, but since you all are under the general fund, that money is being transferred to something else. So, so how are, my question is, how are we going to get funding to improve these? I mean, I'd love to see the Echo Tours come back. I that know. was great. I know. Um, so that half penny you were talking about is the People's Transportation Trust money, which is paying for the trolleys that you see um, and things like that. that. No, we oh, we, oh, well, no. we had we had the build we had the Decade of Progress Bond, and then we had the Building Better Communities mm -hmm. Bond in two thousand four, but there was not a specific uh, designation for the Parks Department. And that it no, not that. It, it, so we had the Building Better Communities Bond Program, which was in 2004. It was a 2.9 billion dollar capital improvement. It was eight questions, and one of those questions was culture and parks. And there was a series of. So this is my okay. So this is where she's. You're right because Victoria's right too. Culture. <laughs> well, in our county, parks and culture were yeah. merged. So to your point, it theoretically was going to parks, but it was really going to, um, you know, the Arch Center and to cultural activities. If we, this is another conversation, yeah. but I will say that having looked at many park systems, the park systems that are the healthiest, that maintain the kind of level that you're talking about, usually have their own funding stream. And we probably need to think about what that is. I mean, I know we're being recorded. Hopefully not everybody in the world is going to watch it. But I, I don't know. Maybe this isn't political. There are many things that we need. We need police. We need fire. We need emergency. We need water and sewer. We really need. But so my hope would be that we would figure out a way to fund parks that doesn't take away from any of these essentials, but also understands that parks are essential. Parks aren't frivolous. Parks are really the essence of life. So, yes. I agree. So Cheryl, want to thank you. Um, you want to come up and introduce the next panel? If you could join me in thanking everybody. <laughs> thank you all. Um, and I, 